This chapter focuses on the role of scarcity and trade-offs in economic decisions. Scarcity is the most basic concept in all of economics. Scarcity occurs when the ingredients for producing things that people desire are insufficient to satisfy all wants. It means that we never have enough to satisfy every single desire we could imagine. Scarcity is a fact of life for everyone, regardless of their demographic backgrounds. A couple of things that scarcity is not. Scarcity is not a shortage, which is another economic term we'll discuss later. And it's not the same thing as poverty. As we just said, even the wealthy face scarcity. Now, production. Production is any activity that results in the conversion of resources into products that can be used in consumption. Resources, or factors of production, are the inputs for the production itself. Next, we'll discuss a couple of different types of resources or factors of production and talk about an example of the farmer. Land is natural resources. For the farmer, land would be his fields and anywhere he stores any of the goods that he produces. Labor is the human resource. Again, for the farmer, it would be field hands, his own labor, or any family members or other workers that do work on the farm. Physical capital is all manufactured resources. For the farmer, it would be some, his tractors or any other implements that he uses with the tractors, as well as any silos. Human capital is accumulated training and education of workers. Again, for the farmer, this would be his knowledge of planting times, when to harvest, how to operate any tractors or machinery that he has, and how or who to sell it to. Entrepreneurship. This is a person who organizes, manages, and assembles the other resources. They're the risk taker and the maker of basic business policy decisions. In the case of the farmer, this would be the farmer if he owns his farm outright, or possibly the investor who backs the farmer if the farmer doesn't own the farm. Good versus economic goods. Goods are all things from which individuals derive satisfaction or happiness. Economic goods are scarce goods for which the quantity demanded exceeds the quantity supplied at zero price. That is, if they were being given away for free, there wouldn't be enough to satisfy all that people would want. Services are tasks that are performed for someone else. They can, all, they can be referred to as intangible goods. You can think of this like the haircut that you see from a barber or a chef preparing your meal at a restaurant. Moving forward, it's important to remember that scarcity occurs when the ingredients, resources, or factors of production for producing things that people desire are insufficient to satisfy all wants. Needs are something that we can't define in economics. However, wants are goods and services on which we place positive value. People have unlimited wants. Opportunity cost. The highest valued next best alternative that must be sacrificed to obtain something or to satisfy a want. When we're calculating opportunity costs, we only consider the next highest ranked alternative because we can only partake in one of the alternatives. Here are a few questions that you might consider when considering opportunity costs. Any activity requires a trade-off. You could always be doing something else with your time or using your money to purchase something else. The value of the trade-off is represented by the opportunity cost that which you give up to obtain something else. We can analyze opportunity costs through a graph. The production possibilities curve, or PPC, represents all possible combinations of maximum outputs that could be produced, assuming a fixed amount of productive resources of a given quality. In this example, we have 12 available hours to study either economics or mathematics. We can split them in any particular way, and this graph should suggest what expected grade we would receive from spending any number of those hours in either area. A question to consider with the PPC with trade-offs. What would happen to the PPC if you were more interested in getting a higher grade in economics? You would likely spend more time studying economics, and according to the PPC, you would ha expect a lower grade on math. The PPC can be used to show the relationship between scarcity, choice, and trade-offs at both the individual and the societal level.
a few assumptions we make with the PPC. First, resources are fully employed. Second, production takes place over a specific time period. That is, we can consider something like a day in a factory and consider what we can actually make. Resources are fixed for the time period. Again, we wouldn't expect a factory to be able to change its machinery or its location in a day, and technology does not change over the time period. Again, that factory is likely not going to be able to produce a different amount because of a technology change over a day. In the next two slides, we'll look at a table showing production possibilities, and then we'll look at a graph where those production possibilities have been graphed. When discussing technology and economics, we're talking about society's pool of applied knowledge concerning how goods and services can be produced. Efficiency. Productive efficiency is producing the maximum output with given technology and resources. Alternatively, efficiency is the situation in which a given output is produced at minimum cost. With the PPC, we're considering the graphing the line where productive efficiency is reached. If we look back at the graph, all productively efficient points are along the line. Any points beyond the line, such as R, are more productive but impossible to reach given the state of technology. Inefficient point, any point below the production possibilities curve at which the use of resources is not generating the maximum possible output. And this graph again, that point, or a point that is inefficient would be S, where we're not producing the maximum amount we could with the resources and technology we have. Law of increasing additional cost. As society attempts to produce more of a good, the opportunity cost of additional units of that good generally increases. This law accounts for the bowed shape of the PPC. In this graph, it's easy to see that as we produce more tablets, the amount of smartphones that we have to give up slowly and then very rapidly increases. That is, the more tablets we decide to produce, the higher the cost and number of smartphones produced. Resources are not perfectly adaptable for alternative uses. In our case that we just discussed, tablets and smartphones may be able to be made by the same machines, but machines that are making smartphones aren't going to make the same number of tablets or they may require extra effort to make that number of tablets. In general, the more specialized the resources, the more bowed the production possibilities curve. For example, the bow in the PPC for smartphones and tablets is probably lower than the bow in the PPC between smartphones and cars. Let's discuss an example of trade-offs. Corn is used in the production of many food products, and it's also used in ethanol for fuels. The government requires the production of more ethanol for fuels, so if we don't increase corn production, the United States has to decide between ethanol and food items. Economic growth. Through economic growth, we can increase the production possibilities of smartphones and tablet devices. Over time, we can produce more of pretty much everything. We can see an illustration of how the PPC shifts outward with an increase in technology or economic growth in the next slide. The PPC can be used to illustrate the trade-off between present and future consumption. Consumption is the use of goods and services for personal satisfaction. We have consumer goods, goods produced for personal satisfaction, and capital goods, goods used to produce other goods. In this slide, we see first the trade-off between capital goods and consumption goods. If we buy some capital goods and not all consumption goods, then we can increase our production possibilities in the following year. Here, we see that if we choose even more capital goods, then we can increase our future consumption of goods more than we could at A. Capital goods and growth. It's possible to forgo consumption goods to produce capital goods. And increasing capital goods stimulates economic growth. This is what we saw in the last two slides. A couple of key observations to make. 
An increase in capital goods at present will lead to a higher rate of economic growth in the future because we can then purchase more capital goods in the future. In the future, the economic system can produce more consumer goods as well if the PPC is shifted outwards by the purchasing of capital goods now. Specialization. Organization of economic activity among different individuals and regions leads to greater productivity. With specialization, for instance, you're in school to gain a specific job, perhaps a business person, and a mechanic went to school to work on vehicles and machines. Each of you is specialized in a specific area so that you can help the other. Okay, but why should we specialize? Comparative advantage, the ability to produce a good or service at a lower opportunity cost, is always a relative concept. In the example I just mentioned, if you go to school to be, run a business and the mechanic goes to school to work on machines, then you have specialized knowledge that you probably wouldn't have time to gain if you were trying to do both at the same time. Absolute advantage. The ability to produce more units of a good or service using a given quantity of labor or resource inputs. Equivalently, the ability to produce the same quantity of a good or service using fewer units of labor or resource inputs. This just means that you're better, in general, at producing something. Rational individuals choose their comparative advantage and then specialize. Specialization leads to division of labor. Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations illustrated division of labor in pen making. Division of labor, the segregation of resources into different specific tasks. The division of labor is just suggesting that specific people have specific jobs that they do rather than doing all the tasks that would come about in life. For instance, not many people would build their own cars, make their own food, run their own business, cut their own hair, and work without other people in general. Analysis of absolute advantage, comparative advantage, and specialization is applicable to individuals, groups of people, and nations. As a result, interstate trade occurs in the United States and international trade occurs between nations. For instance, in California, they may have a great climate and location for growing grapes and making wine, whereas in Mississippi, they may be well suited for growing cotton for making clothing. They may both be able to do the other job. However, if each specializes in what they do better, then there'll be more wine made and more cotton grown overall, and they can trade in both gain. When nations specialize where they have a comparative advantage and then trade with the rest of the world, economic efficiency improves and output increases, average standard of living rises.